Please pray with me. The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. Turn our hearts to you, O Lord, and speak peace to your people. Amen. Please be seated. This past Tuesday, February 13th, the Episcopal Church commemorated the 200th anniversary of Absalom Jones. Jones was the first black priest of the Episcopal Church and the first ordained priest of African descent in the United States when he was ordained in 1802. He was a pioneer of religion, social action, and transformation. Born into slavery in 1746, he taught himself to read by using the New Testament because school was not available for him. Later on, after being able to purchase his freedom, Jones, originally a devout Methodist, worshiped at St. George's Methodist Church, one of the few churches in Philadelphia that opened its door to black people. Yet, as the black population of the congregation increased, racial tensions began to flare. One Sunday morning, while Absalom was kneeling in prayer at the altar rail, a trustee demanded that he and the other black congregants remove themselves from the main sanctuary and go to a segregated galley upstairs, relegating them to the slave gallery in the church that they had helped to build. When Absalom Jones refused to interrupt his prayers, the trustee attempted to forcibly remove him from the altar rail. For this gross indignity, the entire company of black congregants walked out of St. George's, vowing never to return. But Jones was undeterred. Several years later, he helped create a new denomination known as the African American African Methodist Episcopal, or AME Church. Absalom Jones remained a leader and led the church's efforts to become Episcopalian. On October 17, 1794, the African church was formally received into the Diocese of Pennsylvania as the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas, with the rights and privileges of other parochial churches. Absalom Jones faithfully served the people of St. Thomas as pastor and prophet and priest for over 20 years. Absalom Jones was, no doubt, assaulted by many great temptations. The temptation to allow slavery to define him. The temptation to abhor his oppressors and those who would try to deny his humanity and, and denigrate his human dignity, even when those who would oppose him came from within the church. But in facing those temptations, his devotion to God's word was unwavering and his faith and courage remained steadfast. Jones knew who he was, that he belonged to God, was one of God's beloved in Christ, in whom God was well pleased. The temptation to forget this truth in the face of adversity was certainly strong, but God's truth was stronger than Satan's temptations. In today's gospel, we witness Jesus being confronted by temptation in the wilderness. And I like to believe that like Absalom Jones, he knew that God's truth was stronger than Satan's temptations. Like Jones, there is not one of us here today who has not faced temptation of some kind. And Jesus was not exempt from this as well. But Mark's account of Jesus's temptation is very sparse. No real details concerning the experience only the wild beasts and the angels really truly know. We, of course, know more details from the other gospel accounts of Matthew and Luke. But I like the brevity and concise nature of Mark's account. I think it reflects how many people 
feel, how people feel about temptation. They don't want to talk about it. They want to keep any attention to it to a minimum. I feel Mark understands our need to do that when he keeps it short. But well, I'm going to talk about it today. This gospel reading about Jesus facing temptation in the wilderness comes to us every year on the first Sunday of Lent. The season of Lent opens up for us the opportunity to truly examine our motives, our thoughts, our actions, to be open and authentic with God in all areas of our lives, even with our temptations. But what exactly is temptation? Temptation can be defined as the enticement of our natural and good God-given desires to go beyond God-given bounds. The enticement of our natural and good God-given desires to go beyond God-given bounds. We can blame our failure to resist temptation on others, on Satan or God, or, but in reality, in the end, we are the ones who choose to indulge. The nature of temptation is that it is common to everyone. Contrary to what we might believe, being confronted with temptation is not a sin. God is not displeased when we're tempted. It's how we respond to temptations that can trip us up. That's when negative consequences enter the picture. And equally important to remember is that God does not tempt people. God never sets up a situation for someone to sin. God does not put us in circumstances where we then sin and then punish us for our sin. That would just be really wrong and messed up. <laughs> God can test us, yes, but he never tempts us to sin. The stages of temptation can go like this. I will use a relatively benign example, but it's a personal one. First, you have the thought stage. Hmm. Maybe I should buy that ridiculously overpriced, unreasonably unnecessary, but oh so cute, extremely budget-destroying coat. <laughs> then there's the imagination stage. I would look so amazing, all the compliments I would get. I would be a walking Warwick fashion statement. The Chamber of Commerce should pay me for making this village more hip. And then there's the meditation stage. Well, I deserve this coat. Think of it as a reward for, well, who needs a reason? I've spent my time doing my research and I found out that Molly has one and Joe has one and everybody who's anybody has one. Then there's the will stage. It's absolutely my basic human right to buy this coat and I'm determined. Also, my parishioners would want me to have it. <laughs> then there's the choice stage. It's my life, and I can choose to do what I want. And then there's the consent stage. I really won't be affecting anyone by my, but myself, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. And finally, the consequence stage. When the visa bill comes, and I say, oh man, why, oh why did I buy this coat? Needless to say, I returned it. Of course, again, this is a rather benign example, and we know that other instances of temptation can be very serious and grave and severe and negatively impactful. But this example also shows us that we don't actually just fall into temptation, like just accidentally falling off a cliff. It's more nuanced than that. There are certain signposts along the way telling us to slow down and watch where we're headed. 
There are several steps that we intentionally and calculatedly take towards the end result. It's also important to note that the essence of every temptation is to offer a shortcut to meeting actual and legitimate needs we experience. So we need to ask ourselves when we are tempted, what is it that I really want and why am I trying to use this as a substitute? In order to wisely counteract the pull of temptation, we must guard our minds and bodies with the whole armor of God. Scripture offers us wisdom while the Holy Spirit gives discernment and forewarning in, di in difficult times. And yes, we will miss the mark at times. It's inevitable in our humanity. God knows this and still will never give up on us. Temptation is a part of our human existence, but God has not left us to fend off the assaults on our own. To aid us in standing firm against fierce temptations, God's given us a powerful verse of scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. From the Living Bible, it reads as follows. But remember this, the wrong desires that come into your life aren't anything new and different. Many others have faced exactly the same problems before you. And no temptation is irresistible. You can trust God to keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can stand up against it. For he has promised this, and he will do what he says. He will show you how to escape temptation's power so that you can bear up patiently against it. Yes, it's a struggle, folks, and it takes patience. But if we want to respond wisely to temptation, this is a good verse that can become part of our armor of protection. There are steps we can take to avoid temptation, such as taking responsibility and asking ourselves what it is that we are really searching for, focusing on the big picture, identifying areas in our lives of weakness in our lives, finding an accountability friend, reading God's word, and making prayer a vital part of our daily life. And when we fall short, we bring it to God and we ask for forgiveness. We will always struggle with temptation. Yet the Christian life is one of ongoing transformation as God shapes and molds us and refines us to become more like Christ. We are not finished products. Some things will change quickly. Others will be a lifelong process of obedience, perseverance, and repentance. Although the ongoing struggle will continue to be a part of the Christian experience, we are not alone in this struggle. And neither does temptation need to have the final word. For the Lord is mighty to save. Amen.